It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Palaisuji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Well, Lohan, thanks for starting your week off with us. I'm Ryan Kalei joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, we are spotlighting an issue that seems to come up every campaign season, and it's an issue that uh, lawmakers have continued to tackle for some time, and that's regarding housing. That's right. All roads really do lead to housing, whether you're talking about the teacher shortage, medical personnel shortage, uh, a lot of the challenges that we are facing as a state when it comes to affordability. Uh, it all comes back to housing. And so this administration, uh, the governor has said that this is really his top priority and he has employed the first ever chief housing officer. She is joining us live this morning. Nani Medeiros is here with us. Thanks for being here. Aloha. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It is so good to see you. And we want to get, of course, to the housing policy initiatives that you are working on. So interesting because you are the first ever, as we said, uh, chief housing officer the state has had. But it's impossible, of course, not to address the issues that have come up over the last week involving Senator Favela. Uh, but how are you feeling about his apology and everything that has unfolded up until this point? I think it was a really unfortunate incident, and I'm really looking forward to just moving on past it and doing my job. There's too much at stake uh, for us to lose focus on how to make housing more affordable for our people. So that's what I want to focus on. You know, we know that he has uh, apologized, but uh, have you had any direct contact with him or anyone from the Senate? Uh, we know that the governor was actually quite upset also about these comments. Uh, uh, what are, have you had any discussion with leadership or with the senator himself? I personally have not. I did try to reach out to him, um, called him on his cell, texted him, no response. And this was before the, before and after the apologies. I have seen him in a couple of public hearings um, and been testifying, but he has not said anything directly to me, nor has um, Senate leadership. You know, the issues that he raised, uh, you know, talking about the $600 million and what the priority should be when it comes to Department of Hawaiian Homeland spending on that. Can you talk about sort of what your role will be in that and, and you know, just your response to the specific criticism of how that money is to be spent? So my role, I mean, as chief housing officer, it really is a very sort of broad and overall um, position where I'm going to be trying to help address housing, everything that from housing that addresses homelessness up to workforce housing. And any state agency that touches housing produces housing or develops it. So it does include the DHHL 600 million and what becomes of that. I, you know, would like to see that funding maximized to deliver the most amount of units possible to reduce that really huge wait list. Um, you know, the plan, there was a plan that was submitted by the previous administration that the um, Hawaiian Homes Commission had approved and it was sent to the legislature in December. And it's, it's my understanding that the plan, you know, although approved, there's no requirement in the law that that is absolutely what has to be implemented. And it was, you know, we received feedback, Green Administration received feedback that the plan that has been submitted did not include beneficiary input that homestead associations were not consulted, that wait listers were not consulted. And for us, that was concerning. We, we thought that beneficiaries should have some say um, in how that 600 million would get spent, at least be able to provide input, you know, um, or feedback. So we were kind of, I think, looking at it, approaching it from that perspective initially. Um, you know, and then some of the things have happened over the last few weeks, and there's been quite a bit of criticism in any kind of deviation from the plan that had been submitted um, to the legislature and that was commission approved. I think that we are moving ahead with some of the specific projects that were on that plan that had been submitted. We're moving ahead and you know, um, I think the commission, the chair is 
is putting out some RFPs for some of those projects. I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day, um, or details of how that funding gets spent. Um, it's just something that I, you know, like I said, I want to keep my eye on. I want to make sure that they're maximizing that funding um, as much as they can, because 600 million in general funds is very rare for the legislature to appropriate that much money with that much flexibility. We want to make sure that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, we want to make sure that we do a good job with that. So can I just? Yes, no problem. <laughs> And that's life uh, in the way that we live and work now. Uh, you know, I've got small kids at home and Nani obviously has a dog. Interesting though, Ryan, you know, uh, to hear her response talking about the interaction with the Senator there, uh, that they have seen each other face to face, but they have not interacted directly, but you hear very much there. Nani, uh, there's you and there's your dog uh -huh. and you are saying that you really want to move on and sort of making this distinction that uh, you are keeping an eye on the money, but you yourself are not in charge of how it's allocated. Correct. Yes. And, you know, part of part of my job, for example, directly is going to be to try to work across departments and agencies to coordinate, to collaborate. So to the extent, for example, Department of Transportation doing a great job with federal infrastructure funding to the extent that we could partner with DOT for some of the infrastructure that DHHL will need for some of their projects for roadways, highway connections. That would be great, right? That, that's us collaborating and working together rather than DHHL going out and trying to do all of that on their own. That's, that's kind of more so what my role would be um, in helping them with the $600 million. Well, let's uh, take a step back and look at this role that has just been created for you. Uh, it, it, the first time, as Yanji said at the top of the show, that. Uh, an administration has put someone that focuses directly on affordable housing and this uh, ongoing issue that the state faces. Uh, what would what is your vision uh, as you step into this role for the first time? What are some of the main goals that you are hoping to accomplish uh, in this new role and while working uh, under and for the Green administration? Definitely wanting to be able to deliver more housing because more housing, you know, it's a supply demand issue, essentially more housing prices are not going to be as high. The market is not going to be so constricted um, and also making it more affordable. There are things that government directly has done uh, over the last 10, 20 years that adds to the cost of housing that makes it more expensive. And we can address some of those issues in the Green Administration because our governor is, um, I think, such a very, very thoughtful and forward thinking leader and he's open to these, these changes. And so I really want, I'm hoping that we can be very successful in those regards, produce more housing and bring down the cost. You know, what we hear a lot about is this idea of needing to cut red tape, and you're kind of alluding to some of that there. What specific changes do you think could be made uh, in short order that would make a big impact? You know, housing takes a long time to build, but what do you think that could be done right away to alleviate some of the hurdles that you were referencing? Well, I mean, you know, to be to be fair and to manage expectations here, when it comes to looking at things like the regulatory climate, um, some of the you know the regulatory burden that's on development, which directly adds to the cost, that's not something that we can necessarily address quickly. Um, we're talking about statutes, we're talking about um, agencies that have overlapping reviews, we're talking about processes that were created and established at the state level in the 60s, 70s, and 80s which since that time, you know, our counties have evolved heavily and created some of their own departments and agencies with the same responsibilities. And in some ways, you know, there, there's, a, my, there's a school of thought where, you know, home rule, county level, um, you know, management and decision-making is more appropriate than the state level managing individual counties and communities and making those decisions. So I think, with everything that has changed since the 60s and 70s and 80s, and it's 2023, this sort of very comprehensive review has to be done of what kind of processes are out there that housing projects have to go through, what kind of reviews do they have to go through, and approvals do they have to go through, and where can we find duplicative reviews, where can we find reviews that should be ministerial, should not have discretion. Um, I think some reviews have sort of morphed over time to become something that maybe started as being non-discretionary, but has become very discretionary. And, you know, 
for, for example, we, we could easily, we could actually say, you know, for certain reviews, if it's not touching health and safety, approve it. Okay, if it's complying in every other sense, it's there's no risk to life um, or health, then approve that project application for, for whichever you know application they're going through. Water, uh, you know, ship D. I mean, if nothing's found, you know, let's let's move it along quickly. So um, you know, I think that that work is gonna actually be probably one of the maybe longer term things. I would like to see some results maybe by the end of the first year. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, just trying to manage expectations because I know how thick it is, both in the statutes and then in the uh, administrative rules that implement the statute. And then there's each county with their individual ordinances that we want to look at as well. Let's talk a little bit about some of those results and how you're going to measure success within this department. Uh, what, what would, in your mind, would be some of the benchmarks or goals that you folks are trying to achieve uh, whether it be numbers for specific housing or individuals on the streets. I mean, how, how are you going to uh, manage as well as to uh, really deliver on some of the expectations and benchmark goals that you have in place? Well, you know, Governor has made some comments about, I shouldn't say made some comments, Governor campaigned um, and mentioned, you know, 10,000 units that he'd like to build. So that's definitely our goal. Um, we have been able, we've, we've asked for projects in the pipeline from both private sector developers and our state agencies, the HHFDC, the Hawaii Community Development Authority, HCBA, and Hawaii Public Housing Authority. And I've got a stack about this thick on my desk. We've, we've also, I think, gotten from the Land Use Commission projects that they've approved. We're going to be monitoring those projects. We're going to be convening a group of all of the decision makers from the state agencies as well as county agencies that approve any have, have have any role in the approval process for the different permits that these projects need. And we're going to make sure that those projects stay on stay on track. And if they get stuck, then it's going to be my job to get them unstuck and to make sure that they're moving along. Um, and then I think another another goal of mine, which is a, a bit more short term, is if we can prevent any kind of legislation being passed this session that directly adds to the cost of housing, that'll be a win. I'm interested also to talk to you about housing uh, rental vouchers and housing assistance in that frame, in that, in that, in, within this framework. I know that the uh, administration has set out some pretty high high goals in terms of offering increased rental assistance. Do you think that? who do you think basically should get to the front of the line for that rental assistance? Do you think that there should be, you know, leverage given to perhaps teachers or healthcare workers or some of the industries where we see we need a lot more workforce housing and, and we need a lot more workers in that, in those sectors? Or how do you feel like that money should be divvied up? I think that people across the board actually need that assistance. Um, so I, We've, we, we've got a couple of existing programs in the state, rental subsidy programs. Um, there is a request in the governor's budget uh, this year that increases one of the subsidy programs from $1 million a year, which is I think what it's gotten consistently since its inception to $13 million um, split over the biennium. This particular rental subsidy is capped at $500. It has been since its inception. It's been able to help. Um, it's it's been able to help people primarily at thirty percent AMI and below. So you're very very low income earners, and um, pretty primarily I think the uh, priority for for that program is your your lower. I think I think they can provide vouchers for or subsidies for people at eighty percent AMI and below because there's such a huge need they can never really get beyond the thirty percent. So we were proposing a huge increase, as I said, from $1 million to $13 million. Keep the same cap at $500, um, but that will be able, that will allow us uh, to help people that are in sort of those higher income brackets, but still not, you know, making a ton of money. Um, we also are proposing a new program that will support people earning between 80% and 120% AMI. So the people that you were just talking about, Angie, the teachers, um, some of our healthcare workers, and this program provides a loan for a rental, a security deposit on a rental. Um, some people in that income bracket oftentimes have enough money to make the rental payment, 
but struggle with first month and you know first month and deposit when you're moving into somewhere new. So say you're currently in a one bedroom and you can afford the twenty one hundred dollars that you're paying, but your family's gotten bigger and you want a two bedroom. It's twenty four hundred dollars and you can afford the twenty four hundred dollars around a month rent, but you can't afford forty eight hundred up front. So if this program gets passed by the legislature and funded, you can apply for a loan. It's capped at twenty five hundred dollars. You pay it back over four years and then that gets you into the two bedroom. It opens up the one bedroom for someone else to move into and move up, you know, sort of that rental ladder. Um, so we, we kind of really are looking at very a very broad you know, spectrum and how can we help both your your lower income earners and you know, your workforce. We've also had some really great conversations with the healthcare industry where they're trying to creatively come up with programs to help to attract and retain workers. And we've been in discussions with them from about everything from, you know, um, down payment loan assistance <laughs> programs to also uh, perhaps, and this is a big perhaps, but even, you know, looking at a public private partnership on developing housing for healthcare workers. And then I know also that the DOE is exploring um, workforce options for teacher, teacher housing. And there's a number of bills moving through the legislature right now to support allowing the DOE to use public lands, public school lands to develop teacher housing. And we would be, we would strongly support that. I uh, want to also just talk about, you know, when you look at the whole full scale, uh, scope of housing, there, there's so many, of course, price points. There's so many different uh, types of uh, socioeconomic uh, issues that you are dealing with. How do you prioritize that uh, when it comes to the type of housing, whether it be from the Kalhales that we know that the governor uh, is a strong advocate for and that you've worked on. Uh, then you have like the affordable housing projects, the workforce housing projects. Uh, there are different levels uh, of housing and the, uh, the amount of uh, funds, I guess, it will cost to build these different uh, uh, houses based on your economic stat status. How do you prioritize that? Where do you see the biggest need uh, and the state filling in first? They're, they're all a priority. Um, I think that, you know, there's a good amount of investment in state funding that goes towards providing housing, rental housing, um, and, and also to, to a certain extent for sale housing through the, the HHFDC for people earning 120% um, AMI and below. And then within that, there are specific set-asides that each project has to provide a certain percentage of that project in housing to people at 30%, to people at 60%. Um, so, I mean, I... I don't know that we want to necessarily change any of those formulas, but I think that we need to recognize that everybody needs help, you know, and um, there's a very vocal, there's a very, there, the advocates for people who are on the lower side of, you know, earnings, 60% AMI and below, that those advocates are very, very good. They're very good at what they, you know, at, at carrying that message. and. Um, I think, I, in my opinion, therefore, you know, there's there's quite a number of programs that support that demographic. Your your workers from you know that are earning above sixty percent AMI and all the way to one hundred and twenty or one hundred and forty percent AMI, they can still really be struggling, especially if they have kids, if they're a family unit of you know three or more, four or more, or even single parent, you know, with one or two children it is very difficult to make ends meet. And I was in that category. I mean, I lived that. So I think it's really important that we also remember our you know, middle class, it's basically disappearing because they, there isn't a whole lot of assistance for them. Not not as far as like, you know, cash subsidies for, for things like that. Um, so I, I think that they're, I think that they're all important, Ryan. And, you know, I'd like to, rather than choosing one over the other, if we have the resources, I think we need to re we need to direct resources to both. Yeah, t tell us about that a little bit more. I'm interested how your personal experience and and your life experience, you know, informs the work that you're doing. So I was a single mom. Um, my, in fact, the the whole reason I got really really passionate about homelessness and and housing was actually when I worked for Governor Lingle at the time. And one of the areas I advised governor on was housing and homelessness. And at the time, the largest at-risk group for homelessness in Hawaii were single mothers. And my daughter was two at the time. And 
I mean, I was, I lived paycheck to paycheck practically my whole life. Only in the last maybe year or two did I, was I able to stop doing that. I've taken my daughter on one trip her, her whole life till she was 18. Um, and it was to the big Island and I had to take my dad and my sister so that we could split the cost of one room and I could afford it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just very difficult. And, you know, and I wasn't getting any government assistance and I always worked full time. Um, so that kind of, you know, I, I think I have a, a very personal, you know, understanding of the experience of people who work good jobs, you know, but they make too much to get help. They make too little to get ahead. I've never owned a home. I've kind of accepted the fact I probably won't. That's okay. But if I can help my daughter, if I can help other people's kids, our grandkids, you know, the work that I'm trying to do now might not necessarily be realized in my lifetime. It might not be seen until another 20, 25 years down the road, depending on how long it would actually take projects to get through. I want to talk about one of those projects and see this and just get an update. We, we know, as I mentioned, the Kauhales or, or these uh, micro homes that were built really targeting those uh, homeless or those who are looking to just get a fresh start uh, have been popping up over the last few years. Uh, you've worked on some. Can you tell us about the success uh, of these and, and what the demand is? Are we are we planning to see more of these pop up uh, and how that will uh, apply to not only those here on Oahu, but throughout the state? I think that they have been hugely successful. Um, so, you know, there, it, it really is life changing for somebody who goes into the Kohale. An immediately, an immediate sense of of place, community, and safety. Um, and with the support services that are provided, you know, um, in terms of workforce, you know, if they're looking for employment, getting their GED, taking classes. Um, counseling. The one that we built out in Kalailoa has an on-site medical clinic. So the people who live there can actually get primary or behavioral health care right there where they live um, in a private setting. There's definitely going to be more. So we just two weeks ago attended a groundbreaking for Hawaii Island's first Kauhale on the Kona side, which was so exciting. Um, they have another parcel in mind that they're looking at for a second Kauhale and we're, we're ready to support them however we can uh, from the state side. Uh, we, I'm, I'm currently talking with folks from Kauai and Maui to find locations for Kauhale on those islands. And in Kauai, I'm talking with private, a private landowner who's interested in donating his property to do two Kauhales. So I definitely think um, they're going to continue to expand and grow um, and, and, you know, while we have, we started Kohale as a response to address homelessness and I, I can see the potential for it to evolve to being another type of housing um, as we grow, as, as we, you know, look at building differently and living differently within our means, within our land, um, within what's affordable. Kohale are, are, things that can be considered um, to provide housing for folks who aren't experiencing homelessness as well. Because, you know, the model of construction and the model, the model of construction, first of all, is meant to bring down the cost of your rent, right? Um, or if you wanted to get really creative and have Kauhale for sale, you know, for home ownership, you take a $20,000 structure and you mortgage that out. It's, it's so affordable. So, you know, not for everybody, but for somebody maybe either super young or retirement community or, you know, people who don't want a whole lot of maintenance happening. And Kohales are not also limited to tiny homes. You know, Kohale is just basically you've got shared resources and then you've also got it's community oriented. And then you try and also there's a certain design element in your built environment where you're trying to create spaces for community to happen. So yes, I guess it's, it's absolutely going to grow and multiply. Uh, Ryan, I'm super excited to see that happen. I, I'm interested, you know, this whole idea that we could see that expand out to not just providing sort of an emergency shelter, if you will, or a temporary place, but really have that be, um, you know, someone's permanent home. 
do you think there needs to be a larger shift to the way we look at housing? You know, I, you mentioned the Kauhali model, but you know that we need to be more creative in how we think about housing and 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 how we think about where people can live for for everybody to be accommodated, especially when you talk about some of the initiatives that you're working on that you may not realize them uh, for, you know, the policy changes might not be realized for decades to come. How do we, how do we, you know, change the way we look at housing? How are you sort of framing that for yourself in your job? Well, I do a lot of listening, a lot of listening. Um, there are a lot of ideas out there and, um, a lot, I think there's a fair amount of reconciling involved in my job. There are competing priorities and interests. Um, there's climate change, there's energy efficiency, there's a scarcity of land in some, in some places. And then there's an incredible housing need for our people, right? And how do, how, how do, we, how do we plan for a future where we can accommodate all of those things and not sacrifice what I think is our most val valuable resource in Hawaii, which is our people. Um, and if, if we don't, you know, we can't provide that housing, they're gonna keep leaving. <laughs> our people are gonna keep leaving, they're not gonna come back. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the single family home isn't necessarily for everyone, I think, it, plays an important place uh, in the market, the product does, but we need to also be open to living in other types of, of shelter and not maybe needing so much space, um, maybe not needing so many cars. Uh, it, it just, it depends. There's a lot of options out there, Angie, but I'm just, I'm doing a lot of listening right now. It's been mm, two months, two and a half months on the job. Um, and I don't, my style is not to come at something like I have all the, all the answers. I know I don't. So listening, learning, you know, um, and while we have a very comprehensive plan and strategy that will keep evolving as we keep getting input from people, you know. You know, as we wrap up here, I just want to ask you more on, on a personal level as you take on this task. I mean, when you look at this issue, it is daunting uh, and sometimes it can seem overwhelming uh, to try to see how you chip away at something this large with so many different components uh, for someone that is taking on uh, this mantle and this responsibility while also drawing criticism uh, already from, you know, as we talked about at the top of the show, uh, Senator Favela. Uh, how are you personally handling this and, and looking at, at this in this new job while also managing some of these uh, exterior noises that are also coming into play? I'm still, I'm still sorting that out. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a really, really great partner and we've got three great daughters and I think they pro provide the bulk of my emotional support and mental support. Um, I went away this weekend to the Big Island just to kind of get away from the noise. And I actually said to him, I think maybe I should do that once a month um, just to not feel the pressure. I, I mean, I, I, I come home, I come home from the office and I'm still working until nine o'clock at night. And I know that that's not, it's not mentally healthy. It's just not. And I, you know, I've been there before working for Governor Lingle. I want to work smarter this time, uh, being in a governor's office, and I want to be very effective. Um, so I'm still trying to figure it out, Ryan, but I, I at least am aware, which I think is good, that I shouldn't kill myself, <laughs> you know, certainly two and a half months into the job, um, but just try my best, you know, try my best and, and give it everything I have. Yeah, I, I think that it must be daunting. There's just so much, as Ryan noted, to take on. You know, just in the last minute we have left, what would you say to folks about, you know, because I think that they look at this issue and, and as we noted throughout our conversation, you know, this is something that comes up in politics. Every campaign season, every pro politician says, my priority is housing uh, and people still have so much trouble finding a place to live. So what would you tell folks about the work that you're doing and why this time perhaps it is different? This is the first time that we have a governor uh, that is coming at this problem 
with a very strong political will. And I think that we also have people in the legislature just as supportive um, and just as eager to really take, really, really take the issue and make a difference. In my voting lifetime, and I turned 50 last year, this has never happened. So it really is a very unique situation. We've got a governor willing to take the risks. We saw that when he was lieutenant governor, we saw it when he was a legislator. And that's really important uh, because with housing, just the nature of it, you're gonna have to take some risks. Um, if people watching or listening have any comments, any thoughts to share, you can absolutely reach out to me at the governor's office. You can email me or, or call and, and get through to me and give me your ideas or thoughts. And our, our door is always open for input from the public. All right, Nani Madaris, thank you so much for joining us this morning and giving us an update on this new position uh, that you will be leading. Uh, we look forward to having more conversations in the future. This is certainly an issue that uh, we'll continue to discuss. We really appreciate the update. Mahalo. Mahalo. Aloha. Hello. Thank you. Well, great to hear from her. Uh, and it was really interesting to hear just all of the different things that she is managing. She's trying to really tackle this very complicated uh, issue from all sides, looking at short-term goals, the kauhales that we talked about, um, increasing those rental assistance vouchers from about a hundred, uh, no, one million dollars allocated on a, on an annual basis. Now, this administration saying that they want to do twelve to thirteen million, and really trying to address the folks who are uh, what she was saying are not necessarily. Uh, low income enough to qualify services for services and assistance, but never making enough to get ahead. Those are the folks that they really want to try to help. Um, and then just looking long term at policy changes that could help to free up uh, development and clear some of that red tape. Yeah, and a lot of that red tape also exists within the county levels. And so uh, in her role managing and representing the state, uh, it's really, as she mentioned, working with those county agencies and trying to get everybody on the same page to see what redundancies can be taken away to help to expedite the process uh, of some of these projects that would provide housing. We also heard from her uh, there at the end saying that she's really taking a lot of time to just listen, uh, trying to get a better sense of all the various issues that are tied to housing, but recognizing that it is a big ask. Also hearing from her uh, about her thoughts about the record $600 million that has been awarded to the Hawaiian Home uh, and, and really the building of that and her role saying that she is not necessarily in charge or, or has the is overseeing the purview of that spending of that money, uh, but really just trying to find how the state can help facilitate some of the needs and working with DHHL on those matters. And one of the areas that she believes that there is some misunderstanding in her role in that 600 million and what others may think, uh, which may have ultimately led to the comments made by Senator Favela. Yeah, she did say that she did receive the apology, uh, you know, that he made publicly, but that they have seen each other face to face uh, testifying on different measures, but that he has not approached her personally. She says she really wants to move on. She took the weekend to go to Hawaii Island and kind of decompress. It's got to be a lot to take all of this on, of course. And then when you're dealing with those personal criticisms and trying to balance all of that and kind of keep a clear head, you heard her really wanting to just turn the page and get away from that issue and focus on the work that she has because it is so much to take on. We really appreciate her coming on today. Uh, it was very interesting to hear her thoughts about this new role. And we're going to be tracking what she does and, and you know, and, and the progress that we hope to see. And also, I, I do want to note that it was interesting to hear her talk about how personal this work is, saying that she, you know, worked very, you know, for many years, uh, you know, and considered herself one of those Alice families, if you will, a working mom who never really could get ahead. She says that she sort of, you know, made peace with the fact that she doesn't think she'll own a home in her lifetime, but perhaps her daughter will because of the work that she is doing so again, that this is very personal. Uh, on Wednesday, we are switching gears and we will be speaking to the Navy, oh, excuse me there, Navy about Red Hill. Yeah, we're looking forward to this conversation. Of course, uh, Red Hill continues to be an issue. We're going to be speaking with a spokesperson from the Navy uh, to address some of the issues that currently continue to exist. There continues to be issues about transparency overall, getting an update on some of the video footage that has continued to be uh, asked for, uh, as well as just the overall community interaction. There have been some community meetings held over the last few weeks uh, that really have pushed back on Navy officials, and they've had to answer to some of those military families as well as local residents who continue to be upset about the Navy's handling of this. 
We're going to talk to them uh, and get all the answers. Uh, we hope to hear your questions and see you right back here on Wednesday for another episode of Spotlight Hawaii. Until then, take care. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.